everybody and welcome to our presentation this evening, Road Food, How the American Highway System Invented Fast Food. My name is Krista, I'll be your librarian host from the Poughkeepsie Library and please join me in welcoming Sarah Wasberg Johnson back. She's done lots of really cool virtual programs for us this past year and a half. She is also known as the food historian, so she knows all about food history and all things food. So I think we're in for a treat tonight. Just a couple of quick housekeeping things. Um, as usual, please keep yourself muted. Keep your mics and your video cameras off. Um, this will be recorded, so if you did think you missed something or you kind of want to go back and rewatch it, we are recording it at the moment, so give me a couple of days after today to get that video up and running, and we will have it on our YouTube ch channel, which you can find through our website, poklib.org. I'll also just email to everybody who signed up, so whatever email you signed up for when you registered through Zoom, that's where I'll be sending that video to. And one other thing, if you do have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat box. Sarah will be checking that, I think, periodically through the presentation. And definitely at the end, we'll have lots of times for questions. I know she loves questions, so please come up with some questions. And that's pretty much it from me. Um, I'll be watching along with you all. So if you are having any kind of tech issues with sound or video, you can reach out to me directly in the chat and I will try to figure out what's going on there. That's pretty much it. So I'm gonna sign off, pass along to Sarah and I'll see you at the end. Enjoy. Thanks so much, Krista. Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, this talk kind of coalesced because Chris and I were talking about what would be a fun summer food related talk to do. Um, and I know the, there's been a lot of interest kind of like in fast food and also um, uh, different food brands and stuff. I don't know if people have been watching the food that built America on the history channel. Um, but I wanted to talk today about how, uh, American fast food is really influenced by our highway system. So that's all we're gonna be doing. If you have questions along the way, drop them in the chat. I can't promise I'll keep an eye on them while I'm talking, but definitely we'll have plenty of time at the end. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Oh, it's not gonna let me, hold on. There we go. Um, so first I thought I'd talk a little bit about some context about what fast food was like in the United States before automobiles, right? So fast food in the US um, is really focused on um, travel and also kind of urban areas, right? Not a lot of fast food on the farm unless it's like you're going to the garden and just eating something, right? So in urban areas, our biggest um, places to get fast food are street purveyors. Um, push carts, which are kind of a later version of street purveyors. And then also for travel, we have, you know, there's food available in hotels. Um, railroads don't have food at first and really the travel um, experience on early railroads is not great. And we'll talk a little bit about a guy who changes that, Fred Hartley, um, in a little bit here. Uh, you also had county fairs, you had world's fairs, right, where you have large concentrations of people walking around, you're not necessarily sitting down to eat. Um, and so our fast food pre-automobile was really focused on travel and also pedestrianism, we will call it, people walking around um, in a very pedestrian friendly area. So I have a couple of illustrations. Um, this first one is a great painting from 1811, um, John Lewis Crimmel. Uh, it's a pepper pot, a scene in, a Philadelphia, in the Philadelphia market. And um, I don't know if you guys know the interpreter, Not Your Mama's History. They just did a great YouTube video on pepper pot soup in Philadelphia and purveyors of pepper pot soup who were almost exclusively Black women. And it was a way for free Black women um, to make a living. Right, and that's kind of a theme of a lot of uh, street food purveyors. It's people with kitchens. Not everybody in urban areas had access to kitchens, but if you did, you would use them um, to make food that you could then sell to people in your neighborhood that would be sold on the street. And it's kind of like a quick snack. This one is interesting because we have a really wide range of people. 
Um, you know, in the foreground, there's some nicer dressed women and children. In the background, there's a poor woman and there is an old man in a uh, American Revolution uniform, and this is in 1811, right? So this is like 20, 30 years afterwards. Obviously, he's an old veteran, right? So I just find this a very interesting scene in that regard. Um, this is a pushcart market in New York City around 1910, uh, latter half of the 19th century. Push carts become super popular in New York City uh, to the dismay of some of the wealthier uh, city residents, but it was an opportunity for a lot of immigrants not only to make a living as pushcart operators, and just as a note, pushcart operators sold everything, not just food, you know, people selling books and clothes and eyeglasses and stationery and whatever you can think of. Um, and they're great because they don't require a physical location and kind of like modern food trucks, you can move to where um, your audience is, where your, where your uh, customers are, right? So this one is more of like a vegetable market, but people also served ready to eat food like pretzels and pickles and roasted nuts and things like that, other street foods, pies, things that, you know, were ready to eat and people could eat on the go. We also have trains, right? So I talked about early trains, you know, we get trains in the United States, particularly in the Northeast, starting in the 1830s, but they don't really take off for transportation on a wide scale until after the American Civil War. Um, and early trains are pretty rough and they're not super great, but by the 1870s, 1880s, and for sure by the turn of the 20th century, um, they get to be pretty luxurious. And this is um, from Central Pacific Railway, and it says, notice to passengers, this train does not stop for meals. Supper is now ready on Pullman's Palace dining car, cosmopolitan, attached to this train. Right, so previously, trains would stop frequently, um, or they would stop altogether for meals of questionable variety, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but this is one of the early instances of a dining car being attached to a train. And so you start to get food, um, specific foods, mostly hotel influenced foods, um, that become kind of specific to uh, dining cars and railway dining. A lot of the cooks uh, and waiters on dining cars, you see it says Pullman. Um, there's the, the Pullman Porters Union, right? There were a lot of black men in particular working as cooks and uh, waiters on these trains. And so you get the proliferation across the country of some fairly easy to prepare in a small space um, foods, including macaroni and cheese. Uh, which was not necessarily in widespread use um, in the individual households at this time. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about Fred Harvey. Fred Harvey um, really innovates fast food in kind of like an interesting and unique way. It's not only fast food how we think of it now, but it's fast food in terms of the quickness in which it is served. So Harvey represents kind of the, the pre-dining car um, experience. So, and he gets to be so popular, his Harvey houses get to be so popular um, that they continue well into uh, the 20th century. So he really gets started on the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe rail line. He, um, prior to Fred Harvey, like if when the train stopped for water or coal or whatever, that was an opportunity for people to get off the train stretch your legs and try and grab something to eat. And most of the food available was in boarding houses. It was not good quality. It, you might not have that much time to eat it, you know, because it took too long to order. And so you're rushing to get back on the train so you don't miss the train. Fred Harvey thought, this is a mess. We're going to standardize this and make it a much better experience for train passengers and a much faster experience. So he invented the Harvey house. Um, Fred Harvey meals, like all these really high quality and homemade foods, but because the railroad's on a specific schedule, they would have everything like ready when the railroad arrived. So you would order and your food would just instantly be there. And quite famously, we have the Harvey girls. So 
the Fred Harvey paid very good wages to unmarried young women. There were very strict rules governing their behavior, both in and outside the restaurant, and they wore uniforms like this. And um, on, <laughs> on the right there is the postcard seen from the movie Harvey Girls, 1946, starring Judy Garland, who is pictured in one of the kind of classic Harvey Girls uniforms. And those uniforms were designed to protect women from grabby men, just FYI. So he is kind of one of the early pioneers, I would say, of fast food, even before we have automobiles. We also have some fast food developments at some of the world's fairs around the country, you know, things like the waffle cone and the hot dog and all of these things start to be really popularized by world's fairs. This is a Chicago Columbian, Ex the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. And 1893 is really a turning point in American history for a lot of reasons. We have this huge world's fair. Um, it's the start of a big economic depression, the depression of 1893, which lasts until 1897. It is not a quick one. Um, and we also have the development of the first American automobiles in 1893. So I chose the World's Columbian Ex Exhibition just because, you know, it's kind of this turning point in American history. And also because there's this amazing bird's eye view of this huge campus, right, of this um, huge exhibition. There are other giant ones. There's, um, of course, one of the first is the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia in 1876, uh, right, for the American Centennial. Um, there's the Panama Pacific Exhibition in California. I forget the exact date. Uh, and then, of course, there's the St. Louis World's Fair, I believe in 1907, right, that's what another Judy Garland film, Meet Me in St. Louis, is based on. So at the turn of the 20th century, these kind of big fairs, these big expositions were common, but so were state and county fairs kind of on a smaller scale. And so there's a lot of food innovation occurring as part of these fairs. All right, automobiles. I talked about 1893 being kind of a pivotal year for automobiles in American history. So automobiles are not invented in the United States, they're invented in Europe um, by Carl Benz, right, a Mercedes man. But in 1883, um, I'm gonna mispronounce this, auto historians are probably gonna be mad at me, but I think it's Dury Motor Wagon Company forms. Um, and they produced the first American made automobile in 1896. And there were other people trying to produce horseless carriages and, and other things at this time. But really, they're really the first people to get their stuff together. And they end up entering into an auto race with uh, other European automakers and other American automakers, including electric cars. And they, it's like in the middle of winter in Chicago, right? And they end up being the old, like they're the first back by several hours. So they win the race. So it's kind of this brand new little startup company that nobody really knows anything about. Thanks to this auto race gets to be really quite famous. Um, and it proves that Americans can make automobiles as good or better than Europeans. And of course, um, there is a much higher market in the United States for automobiles because our train system um, was not as well developed as it was in Europe. And also we have a much larger area, a uh, geographic area um, for people to access. So automobiles start to kind of be able to go where trains don't go, right? So um, you get kind of this automobile culture among the wealthy at first, because of course they're very expensive and only wealthy people are able to afford them. But then in 1908, what does the Ford Motor Company do? Henry Ford introduces the Model T, uh, which makes automobiles affordable for a lot of people. And you start to see the proliferation of automobiles throughout kind of many different social strata across the United States. Um, and then of course, for sure, by the 1920s, they're spreading, we get the rise of trucking in the 1920s um, and personal automobiles and um, you know things like uh, buses and things like that. 
So um, it really starts to become an integral part of American culture in a way that is not necessarily true in Europe at this time period. So what do you eat when you're traveling by car? Well, some of the earliest things you eat, you have to bring yourself. And there, I don't have any pictures, sadly, because I didn't want to make too, too many slides. Um, this is a picture uh, from 1910 of a group that's picnicking in the redwoods of California. Right, they've got their little picnic campers and stuff. But, um, you know, a lot of companies developed specialty equipment specifically designed for automobiles, for picnics, picnic hampers, things to take your food with you. Um, but that requires planning and storage, right? And thinking ahead. And Americans are not always super great at that. And it's difficult to pack enough food for a long trip, right? So you start to get demand for food along the roads, even in the 1900s and 1910s. Part of that is that you have to have a good enough road to drive on. We have um, this image from 1903, it was published in 1903, and most of the roads in the United States at the turn of the 20th century were dirt, right? If you lived in the Northeast, you might have some older um, post roads, which are maybe built on top of corduroy roads, which had logs, you know, placed in order to help keep down the mud. But once you got out west, that was not true. So this is some poor Illinois farmer um, with his wagon wheels almost up to the axles in these ruts on the roads. So there started to be a movement to improve roads across the country. And it was started, believe it or not, by bicyclists, not automobile <laughs> Because if you've ever ridden a bicycle and hit a large rock or other obstruction, you know it's not great for a bicycle. It's a little bit easier on a wagon. You know, you have at least two side-by-side -side or four side-by-side -side wheels. So it's a little bit more stable. Not so with the bicycle. So the early movement, the advocacy for paved or improved and smoothed roads was started by bicyclists. Um, in 1893, the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, establishes the Office of Road Inquiry, right, to figure out, you know, and it was very much an economic thing about getting agricultural goods to market. Um, what might be a way to improve American roads to better serve farmers and agricultural markets? 1912 to 1913, we have the establishment of the Lincoln Highway. Um, this was a privately funded and routed highway, basically connecting some existing roads, um, putting up some signage to get from New York to San Francisco. It's our first kind of cross country highway. And remember, you know, states all have their own roads. Some roads just kind of formed because that's where people had been going for a long time. A lot of existing roads today, including highways, um, are on uh, old trade routes that predate European contact in the United States. Um, so this was really the first one that here is a way you can actually drive from New York to San Francisco. Again, it was not a great trip. It took a couple of weeks, right? And it was basically only for the adventurous auto enthusiast to try and go this route. This is another example um, from a USDA publication called Public Roads. Um, so this is depicting a road near Canadaigua in New York, a localish example. Um, and it says, what an excess of about 37 ton units above normal traffic can do to a modern hard surfaced highway. And this is published in June of 1918. So this is illustrating the effects of World War I era uh, truck traffic on a surfaced public road, but the technology is not able to withstand that much heavy truck trucking. And you can see how absolutely destroyed <laughs> this road is. So this is kind of the state of roads in early adoption of automobiles. All right. so. 
in the early days of automobiles, we're kind of, we have automobiles now, what does fast food look like at this time period? So most fast food is still not that focused on automobiles in the turn of the 20th century. So we have soda fountains are super popular, driven in large part by prohibition, right? Um, even though we don't officially get prohibition until uh, 1920, there is a very strong temperance movement throughout the United States um, to avoid alcohol, particularly for young people and women and children. And so you get the proliferation of soda fountains but soda fountains are, you know, unlike restaurants where you have to cook something and maybe wait a long time to get your food. Soda fountains are, it's a soda drink, just scooping ice cream and plopping some soda and syrup, and then there it is. It's really quick. Um, you also start to get department store lunch counters. And this is to service shoppers and to get them to stay in the department store longer, like not leave to go out and get something to eat and then come back, right? You want them to stay in the department store because they're more likely to buy more stuff. So you get the proliferation of like Woolworths counters and things like that. Um, in 1902, you get the Automat, which we'll talk about in a little bit, mostly restricted to very um, urban areas. And then of course, for fun and tourism, you get places like Coney Island, other beach resorts, places where you're gonna have temporary seasonal concessions, right? So that's kind of what fast food looks like. Um, while we have automobiles, maybe to go to the soda fountain or go to the department store or go to Coney Island, um, but they're not specifically about cars. So this is an example um, of, uh, I didn't put the date on here, I believe it's 1890s, a soda fountain in Mifflinburg, Pennsylvania. Um, it is inside of a pharmacy, and that was very common at the time. You know, you'd start a pharmacy and then, hey, let's have a soda fountain. And then it turns out that soda fountain is like your primary source of revenue, <laughs> right? And the pharmacy is just kind of extra. But you can see it almost looks a little bit like a saloon, right? With the bar, the marble top bar, and then there's a mirror in the back and kind of all the accoutrements for making sodas. Um, so it's a little reflective of the saloon, but it's not, right? We're not serving on the hall here. Um, this is a little bit later example. I thought this was a fun one. This is from about 1930. This is the longest lunch counter in the world at the Los Angeles Woolworths, right? So you can see the department, the random department store stuff on the right, and then this crazy long um, lunch counter that's operating kind of like a diner might, but it's really usually a fairly limited um, menu, mostly cold items, right? Sandwiches, sodas, pie, cake, that kind of thing. Stuff that can be served quickly and easily. And then we have the automat. So this is a, a detail from 1915. Um, they started first in Germany and then uh, Horn and Hardart, who's really the, the main purveyors of automats, um, open one in Philadelphia, so a very urban area, and then in 1912, they opened one in Times Square. And then they're most popular through the 1920s to the 1950s, and they started to kind of fall by the wayside in the 1950s um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of which is their labor practices. <laughs> they had very poor labor practices. So how an automat works is you have a kitchen area behind this these row of like little almost they look like post boxes, right? And you put in your nickel or dime or whatever, and it, that opens the door and you take out the thing that you want. And each slot has a different type of food and a different food. So like, you know, one slot's gonna have all slices of pie, you know, cherry pie. And another slot's gonna have all egg salad sandwiches. And another slot's gonna have, you know, cinnamon rolls or something. Um, but you have to have people <laughs> Uh, it's not like a vending machine in the sense that it's pre-filled, pre-made. You have people in a kitchen in the back making all this food fresh and refilling all of those slots as they're emptied. The Automat also became very famous for refilling, like turning over all of their coffee every 20 minutes. So the coffee was always very, very fresh. So you had people making the food, you had people um, plating the food and refilling the, the windows in the Automat. You had people um, 
at the cashier level and then you had people fussing and cleaning um, all the dishes because we're using real dishes and real forks, right? Nothing disposable. And they were working very long hours and not getting paid very much money. So there were some labor disputes that Automat like really kind of struggled with that ended up, they had to kind of like raise their prices to cut into their profits. Uh, and then they started to get competition from modern fast food. And also in the 1950s, we had people moving out of urban areas and more into the suburbs, right? So the Automat became slightly less popular um, and viewed kind of as more old fashioned uh, as you know, our culture was changing at that time. So this is from about the 1930s. And this shows you, I like this little postcard, it shows you how it works. Then you put your nickels in the slot. Each little window is a different price depending on what's in there. Um, you know, you turn the knob to put your nickel in and then you can open the door and take out your thing and then you close the door and it resets and the person in the back goes and like boop, pushes the stuff forward and then it's ready for the next person, right? All right, so now we're starting to get into like actual fast food and I'm, this part I really enjoyed researching because some of, some of our quite famous um, restaurants have very early origins. So one example is Nathan's Famous for Nathan's Hot Dog starts in 1916 on Coney Island with Jewish Polish immigrants Nathan and Ida Handbroker. Um, Nathan worked at another restaurant on Coney Island and decided to, um, you know, strike out on his own. His wife Ida developed the hot dog recipe and his mother-in-law the spicing for the sausage. Um, and they basically purposely went into business to undercut the prices of other restaurants, including the one that Nathan used to work at on Coney Island, right? Hot dogs were not new, but they weren't like a thing as much. Um, Nathan's Famous really helps popularize the hot dog as like the perfect beach food, the perfect street food, the perfect vacation food. Um, but they just have the one location on Coney Island until they open a second one in 1956. By then it's Nathan's son running it. Um, they opened a third in Yonkers uh, in 1965, right? And then of course, as we get later into the 20th century, they start to proliferate and you get the thing where now you can go get a Nathan's famous hot dog at like a three-way rest area, <laughs> right? But it all started in 1916, which is pretty cool. So um, this is the famous hot dog stand in Coney Island. Uh, this put photo is taken in 1947 and you can see, you know, the multiple ways you can access the stand and, and the crowds and the lines. And of course they have all of their advertising there. They have beer, they have root beer, frankfurters, all kinds of fun stuff, hamburgers, roast beef. So it's not just hot dogs, but that's what they become most famous for because they have their own recipe. Another super early fast food place is a and w. Um, This is another great story. Uh, Roy W. Allen opens a roadside stand in Lodi, California in 1919, basically to serve root beer for like a returning veterans of World War I parade. <laughs> so he opens this temporary little root beer stand. It's so popular. He decides, hey, I got to try and make this a real thing. Um, so he partners with Frank Wright and they opened their first restaurant in Sacramento in 1923. Um, A&W standing for Allen and Wright. Uh, and then they open um, the first drive-in restaurant in California in 1925. So already in the 1920s, they are kind of capitalizing on the automobile culture in California. They're not the very first drive-in restaurant in the country. Um, there is one that predates them by a couple of years, but they're a very early version. And then also in 1925, Allen franchises A&W, which is perhaps the first food, fast food franchise um, in the nation, which is kind of cool. So for those of you who don't know a franchise, how franchise works is the franchisor offers basically the name and the product to a third party who pays rights or royalties, um, usually an annual fee, uh, to, to use the, that brand and the product, but then they run their own store. Um, and this gets a little interesting because 
from 1927 to 1928, Jay Willard and Alice Marriott, sorry, there should be two teams there. Yes, those Marriott's of Marriott Hotel chain get their start with a and w franchises in washington dc and they are the first ones to add hot food to the root beer sales um and they call their little uh sub franchise hot shops um and then from there the franchises proliferate in 1963 um a franchisee in lansing michigan invents the bacon cheeseburger no other fast food places have really disputed this claim. Obviously, people were putting bacon on cheeseburgers before this, but um, they're one of the first ones to make it um, a regular part of the menu, uh, in large part because customers kept asking them to put bacon on their cheeseburgers, so they just made it part of the menu. Um, these are great photos. So this is the first AW hot shop owned by the Marriott's in 1927, and I love that it shows the menu in the window because it is not what you would expect of an e and w right? So it's root beer, coffee, hot tamales, and chili con carne by people with the last name Marriott in Washington, D.C., <laughs> right? So this is kind of, um, you know, Mexican and Tex-Mex and Southwest food was really popular in the 1920s and 30s, and I think that's probably why that's what they're selling. But I just found it interesting that, oh, they're the first to serve hot food. So of course you think it's gonna be like burgers and hot dogs and it is not. Um, this is another early, this is our second um, hot shop. And it's the first drive-in on the East Coast that we know of, opened in 1928. Uh, and basically these franchises allowed the Marriott to kind of leverage their hotel business, um, shifting to hotels in the 1950s and they will come up again in other fast food franchises. So just keep an eye on the Marriott family. All right, a very famous one, White Castle, 1921. Um, Walt Anderson is the founder, but in 1916, he starts a diner in a converted rail car um, and then opens a couple more. And in 1921, with Edgar Ingram, they opened the first White Castle. And it's considered the first hamburger-based fast food restaurant. And they are pioneers for a number of reasons. Um, for one, it's called White Castle because both the exterior and the interior and the uniforms are all white. And this is really reflective of um, claims of sanitation, right? Even in this time period, it's like fast food is like considered kind of low brow. It's maybe kind of questionable cleanliness and sanitation. So everything in White Castle is like tile white tile or sh shiny white surfaces that it's very obvious if they are not clean, right? So they kind of make a name for themselves in that instance. They also have kind of an assembly line um, operation that a lot of subsequent fast food restaurants um, copy. And of course, they specialize in their little sliders. Uh, and they're also one of the first restaurants to offer takeout, right? So you're not just either eating it right then and there or eating it in the restaurant. So they expand in 1922. In 1933, Anderson sells out to Ingram. They don't add a drive through until 1980, which we will get to later. Um, so again, they have some innovations, including some technology innovations, um, one of which was prefabricated uniform buildings out of an enameled steel product that they kind of invented, <laughs> which is pretty cool. So they're one of the first to have like a uniform look for their architecture, like the fat, that's like the start of fast food architecture. Um, they also adopt vertical integration. So they have centralized bakeries for all their buns. They start their own paper products company to manufacture their little paper hats and the bags and everything. And then of course they have their own building prefabrication company as well. There were a lot of imitators of White Castle and White Castle is actually pretty aggressive at going after in in imitators for trademark infringement, infringement. One of the most famous is White Tower, um, which like basically just copied them slightly different in a lot of different ways, including the architecture, including some of their slogans um and the court cases are like yeah you can't you can keep the white tower name but you can't copy their slogans and you cannot copy their architecture um and then interestingly unlike a lot of fast food companies this one was never franchised 
all white castles in the United States are still owned and operated by the Ingram family. So White Castle Corporation owns all of the white castles in the United States. They are not franchised. Um, and that's part of the reason why they are not as prolific throughout the country. Um, because the Ingram family is like, this is enough. We don't need to get any bigger. <laughs> so that's why you don't see white castles in every state. All right, this is a really early one. It's not dated, but it has to be before 1933 because it's got Walt Anderson's name on it, right? Um, so this is a really early version. Um, and then it says, buy them by the sack, right? Talking about their little five cent slider hamburgers. And then this is a later one from an, around the 1950s. You can see the architecture has changed a little bit. Um, the prices have gone up slightly. Hamburgers are no longer five cents, they're 12 cents. <laughs> um, but it's still that kind of iconic look. Everything is still very white, very polished, very clean. All right, next we have Howard Johnson's. Um, not all of you might be familiar with Howard Johnson's or Hojo, as they're called. Um, the hotel chain is still around, but the restaurants are not. The last Howard Johnson's restaurant, I think, closed in like 2017. Um, but it starts out as the Pharmacy Soda Fountain. Um, Howard Deere and Johnson opens one in 1925 in, in Quincy, which is not how you pronounce it apparently in Massachusetts, but I forget how. Um, there's another fast food place that gets a start in Quincy, and we'll get to that later. And basically, his, his experience is the soda fountain is the most successful part of his business. So he's like, hey, everybody loves ice cream and soda. So he starts some seasonal concession stands at the beach. Um, very successful, like selling out of ice cream and other sodas. He develops 28 different flavors of ice cream, which I think plays a role in that. Um, and then kind of also becomes famous for uh, fried clams, right, on the beach. So leveraging all of that, he opens the first sit-down restaurant in Quincy in 1929, starts franchising in 1935. And the second restaurant in Orleans, um, is at the specifically chosen this location because it's at the intersection of two very busy roads, right? So Howard Deering is like, hey, I'm gonna capitalize on this automobile thing and travelers. And that becomes a huge part of um, their mission kind of as a restaurant is to capitalize on travelers. And they expand that significantly by 1939 so in four years they go from two restaurants to 107 mostly along highways they have a really hard time in world war ii the franchisees um do not do well with with gas rationing with food rationing so they're down to just 12 by the end of world war ii but clever howard um wins the rights to install Howard Johnson restaurants at service areas in 1940 for the Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, Connecticut, and New Jersey turnpikes. So obviously it's 1940, this is before we have our big interstate highways, but that would be like on the throughway, every rest area that you stop at, there's a Howard Johnson there. <laughs> so he starts to make, this restaurant starts to become super, super familiar our travelers throughout the Northeast. Um, in 1954, they opened their first motor lodge. So again, they start as a restaurant and then get into the hotel business um, in large part because I think they're so closely associated with travelers. And a lot of the hotels also have restaurants. Um, but by the time we get to, you know, later in the 20th century, the restaurants kind of start to decline with competition from other fast food places. Um, so it's just really the hotels that I left today. So this is on a circa 1940s um, postcard. Of course, it's Howard Johnson's. It's the restaurant, not, not the um, hotel, but it still has that iconic orange roof that the hotel has also adopted. That's 28 flavors of ice cream right at top. Fried clams is the first thing listed, and then they also have other food listed. Um, but they are really best known for their ice cream and their fried clams. And interestingly, like, so... Traditionally, fried clam is like the whole clam that's fried, and Howard Johnson said the feet, the foot of the clam, so it's like strips. Um, 
which proved to be a lot more popular um, and probably also cheaper. <laughs> so that's part of what they're known for. And this is kind of a trend that's happening across the United States. As people are traveling, they are choosing the familiar over the new. So you know you can go to Hojo and get yummy ice cream and fried clams, and it's gonna be the same pretty much wherever you go in the country, right? And that's kind of a theme with fast food locations that continues throughout the 20th century. All right, so also a thing, we've talked a lot about the Northeast, right? Let's talk a little bit about the Southwest. So Route 66, classic American highway, it's established in 1926, it's Chicago to Los Angeles. Um, it connected previous auto trails. So again, before we have any real interstate signage even, mandates, whatever, you maps weren't necessarily that great. You had to kind of navigate on your own. And what auto trails would do is they would paint rings on like telegraph poles <laughs> and put a little bit of signage up so you knew that you were on the right road. So um, Route 66 connected some of those existing auto trails um, and then uh, they started to pave it which was not common in the 1920s and early 30s. So they finished the paving project in 1938. They moved all the way out to Los Angeles County. And that's considered the first major U.S. highway, right? So the Lincoln Highway is the first really like cross-country route that's available, but it's not paved. It's not even necessarily, there's not a lot of signage. Um, this is really the first U.S. highway that's paved, there's signage, it's clear where you're going. Um, and it plays a huge role in the 1920s and 30s, um, in part because of the Dust Bowl. Uh, it becomes um, like the route for Okies to get to California. Um, it plays a huge tourism role throughout this whole period, um, even during the Great Depression, although the Great Depression is more about um, actual transportation rather than tourism. By the time you get to the 1950s, it's hugely popular with vacationers, um, you know, going and seeing the sites in the American Southwest. There's this great, probably from around 1950, judging by the cars on the four lane highway, um, also known as the Will Rogers Highway. So of course you gotta have Will Rogers right there. And this is just a little map illustrating the different states that it passes through um, and some of the sort of iconic things that you'll see along the way. So 1930s, Great Depression. In the 1930s, we have the development of Kentucky Fried Chicken. Now we don't have a lot of um, restaurants developing in the 1930s that survived the 1930s, right? 1930s is a tough time to be operating a restaurant. People don't have a lot of money. There's not a lot of disposable income. There's not a lot of vacationing happening. Um, so Harlan Sanders, in 1930, takes over the lease of a shell filling station in North Corbin, Kentucky. And in 1934, he purchases the pure oil station across the street because it's a better location. It's easier to see from the road. Um, at the, the shell filling station, he had sold food like biscuits and country ham and stuff like that. Um, but it's not until the pure oil station that he starts selling fried chicken. And this is like classic cast iron skillet fried fried chicken. It gets to be super popular, in some ways more popular than the fact that it's a gas station. <laughs> um, it becomes so successful in 1936, he becomes an honorary Kentucky Colonel, right? So Harlan Sanders becomes Colonel Sanders, uh, which is a big part of Kentucky Fried Chicken history. Uh, in 1940, he purchases a motel across the street, and so it becomes kind of like a destination right, to go there, you're staying there, you can get fried chicken, there's a filling station right there, if you're traveling by car, it's like a one and done place to stay. Um, oh, I have these kind of switched around, but um, one of the things that he innovates on is that frying chicken in a skillet is very slow. Um, and people did deep fry chicken at that point, but Harlan Sanders was obsessed with quality. Right, he, was, he did not think that deep fried chicken was good. He thought it was dry. He thought it was overcooked. So he learns of a pressure cooker, commercially available pressure cookers. And he thinks to himself, I wonder if you could pressure fry 
So what he does is he invents the pressure fryer, which allows you to create fried chicken that tastes like it was slow fried in a skillet, but you're doing it much faster, right? Because it's a high pressure environment. So it's gonna cook things much faster without drying it out like a deep fryer would. Uh, 1940 is also when he develops the 11 herbs and spices recipe that is still a secret today, although salt and pepper are two of the main ingredients. <laughs> Um, and then in 1952, he decides to franchise, right? This is a thing that's very popular in the mid-century is to franchise your restaurant. And so he franchises the recipe to Pete Harmon in Utah, who owned Harmon Cafes. He owned a bunch of them. And uh, one of Pete's employees, or Pete himself, I forget, suggests calling it Kentucky Fried Chicken, because of course they're in Utah. So if you're in Kentucky, you don't need to call it Kentucky Fried Chicken because it's fried chicken in Kentucky. But in Utah, Kentucky Fried Chicken is a thing. Um, in 1955, Harlan Sanders, the OG Kentucky Fried Chicken, becomes a victim of the Eisenhower Interstate Highway System, right? Well, I guess not technically Eisenhower by then, but I-75 bypasses North Corbin. So Sanders sells out um, and then just focuses on expanding the franchise um, to other areas, including he works with Dave Thomas of Wendy's, who we'll get to it towards the end. Um, so this is the original Sanders Court, which was um, his motor lodge, and also he had, you can see in the corner there, that little yellow sign says cafe, right? There's a filling station right out front, so it's kind of like an all-in-one thing. Um, this is what he ends up selling after Corbin gets bypassed um, by the uh, highway it goes around. Um, and then this is a pretty early um, image of Harmon Cafe in Salt Lake City, Utah. And look who's on the sign, <laughs> right? We have our Colonel right there on the sign and it says featuring Colonel Sanders Kentucky Fried Chicken. And the reason why they do it is because um, Harmon, Pete Harmon, when he starts selling this Kentucky Fried Chicken, his sales go up by like 70%. <laughs> so he's still a cafe, like he still has regular food that he always had, but the Kentucky Fried Chicken is what becomes the draw for a lot of people. Um, and that helps Harlan Sanders build his franchise of Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurants out beyond Salt Lake City. All right, so some impacts of the Great Depression and World War II. We've talked about this a little bit already. Um, the 1930s is really America on the move, right? We have the Dust Bowl, we have Southwest Tourism, we have Route 66. You get the development of a lot of nat national parks in the 19 teens and 20s, but by the 1930s become really popular. Um, South, the American Southwest is featured in a lot of um, Hollywood movies. It's featured in a lot of um, like fashion editorials and things like that. It's just really popular at that time. Um, and then you also have the development of the Public Roads Administration, which is the Great Depression era version of the Public Roads Euro, right, which is before and becomes after. So you do have some improvement of highways um, during the Great Depression, like you do with the WPA, building buildings, and the CCC, working on national parks and state parks and things like that. World War II puts a little bit of a cramp in our fast food expansion, largely because it is so closely tied to automobile culture, and there's gas rationing, there's rubber and tire rationing, there's food rationing, so it's difficult to keep a restaurant, particularly a fast food restaurant, which focuses on a lot of meat, sugar, and fat, right? It's hard to keep those open um, when you have food rationing. But post-war, we have this huge economic boom and a return to prosperity. We have a ballooning middle class, and people have a lot of disposable income, and so that is really when a lot of these fast food places that started um, earlier in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, which we'll get to, uh, really start to take off. So just wanted to give a little bit of indication of how integral automobiles were to American life at this point. This is a squatter's camp in Sacramento. Um, so these are people escaping the Dust Bowl, right, and trying to find work and failing to find work in California, right? 1940 is still the Great Depression. Great Depression doesn't end until we enter uh, World War One, or sorry, World War Two 
in 19, end of 1941, 1942. Um, so just an example, there's people, homeless people basically living in their cars. Um, so the car has really become a huge part of American life by this time. All right, just a brief overview of the Federal Highway Administration. I know it's so incredibly interesting. But I wanted to give a little bit of a timeline. So in 1993, we have the Office of Road Inquiry, which is when we're figuring out, like, can we have federal highways? 1899, um, again, Office of Public Road Inquiry. So it's not just any roads now. It's public roads, right? State highways. Um, 1905, it becomes the Office of Public Roads, right? We're done asking questions. We're going to start actually trying to manage public roads in the United States. Um, 1915, it becomes the Office of Public Roads and Rural Engineering, right? So this is all about civil engineering, bridges, you know, cutting roads through passes, things like that. 1918, we're in the middle of World War I. Um, it becomes the Bureau of Public Roads. And then during the Great Depression, it becomes the Public Roads Administration. Then it goes back to being the Bureau of Public Roads after the war. Um, and then in 1967, it becomes the Federal Highway Administration. So in the 1960s is when it really focuses specifically on highways and, in fact, interstate highways, um, which becomes the main focus of this federal administration rather than just any public road. All right, here's a famous one, McDonald's. Gets to start technically in 1940, although um, Patrick McDonald, who is the father of the McDonald brothers, opens a food stand near Route 66 called the Airdrome. Um, and then his sons, Richard and Maurice, opened their first McDonald's in 1940. In 1948, they add the Speedy system, um, which is basically, again, they're kind of Henry Fording it with an assembly line in the back, right? Sort of copying White Castle, but I don't know that they necessarily knew White Castle was doing that. So they developed their own system. Um, and they have, uh, they had previously car hops. It was a drive-in, the first McDonald's was a drive-in, and they had car hops. In 1948, they shut all that down. They streamline their menu, right? Very limited menu. Um, and they're focused on both quality and speed. So it's all about how can we get decent quality food to the customer the fastest. And their original mascot is Speedy. You can still see him in vintage neon signs in some areas. Sorry, my computer is digging. Um, but they decide in the 1950s that they, they want their own fast food architecture. So they talk to an architect to build a new, design a new style building with these golden arches. I'm not really sure where the golden arches came from. Of course, if you see some of the old buildings, I'll show a picture in a minute. It's two arches side by side in parallel, not going this way. Um, and the first franchisee um, opens in Phoenix, Arizona in 1953 with that new style building. Um, in 1954, Ray Kroc is like involved in the um, like malt mixing machines, like the milkshake mixing machines. And he is like, why is this McDonald's place purchasing like six of them? <laughs> and so he goes to check it out and he is really impressed by the system, the speedy service system that um, the McDonald brothers have built. And he says, hey, I want to get involved. So he comes on board in 1956. And he comes up with a very interesting idea. I don't think most people know this about this story, um, but it kind of is very interesting. I was surprised when I found it out, which is basically that with their franchisees, McDonald's Corporation owns the real estate that the McDonald's buildings are on. Which I find very, they have like something like $9 billion in real estate on their balance sheet, or maybe it's 90, I don't remember. It's some insane number. But so they own the land, even though the franchisee is the one running the store. I found that very interesting. Um, 1961, 
Ray Kroc really wants to expand, the McDonald brothers are like, hey, listen, we've got like the corner on Southern California. We don't think this is gonna work in other colder areas of the country. We don't want to expand. So Ray Kroc buys them out, right? He, he doesn't have the money himself. He gets some partners, he buys them out. Um, and then they just start expanding all over the country. In 1962, they introduced filet of fish In 1965, we get Ronald McDonald, becomes the new mascot, not, not Mr. Speedy. Um, and then 1968, we introduced the Big Mac, and things just kind of proliferate from there, right? McDonald's is now probably the biggest fast food, franchise fast food corporation in the country. So this is one of the first McDonald's franchises opened in 1955 in De Plains, Illinois. And you can see the golden arches are parallel and we've got Speedy there on the sign. And of course they sold 15 cent hamburgers, not quite five cents, um, 15 cents, a little different, but still pretty darn cheap. All right, another really early fast food um, location that may seem familiar is Dairy Queen, also established in 1940. It starts in 1938, the McCullough family invents a soft serve ice cream recipe and they convince one of their friends who owns a restaurant to try it out in the restaurant. And they sell like a thousand servings in a day. <laughs> it becomes super popular. Um, so in 1940, they opened the first Dairy Queen in Juliet, Illinois. And by 1941, one year later, 10 stores are franchised. By 1947, there's 100 stores. 1955, there's 2,600 stores across the country. Um, it's a huge franchising success. In large part, I think, because the soft serve, soft serve was so easy to make. Right, once you have the machinery, it's not like hard ice cream, it's much quicker. Um, it's easier to have a single recipe that can be used uh, across franchises. Um, and it's quick, right? It's quick and who doesn't love ice cream? And I have to say, just as a personal aside, I grew up um, in Fargo, North Dakota and I went to school in Moorhead, Minnesota. And there is a Dairy Queen in Moorhead, Minnesota whose franchise agreement dates to 1941. So they are one of the first franchise stores in the nation. And because they have one of those original franchise contracts, they are not beholden to corporate dairy merchants. So they can do pretty much whatever they want, <laughs> including, you know, doing things like putting twice as much toppings in their blizzards as a regular dairy queen. So just a fun aside, that was the dairy queen I grew up with. All right, post-war, I talked a little bit about this already, but we have rising prosperity. We also have an agricultural surplus coming out of World War II. Obviously, we ramped up our agricultural production to serve the war effort to help feed our allies at post where we have this surplus. So agricultural prices, especially commodity prices, start to drop, which means it's much cheaper to buy things like corn syrup and sugar and white flour and ground beef right? These, these things get cheaper in the 1950s. Um, we have more disposable income as a country in the 1950s. You have, again, a huge proliferation of automobiles in the 1950s. There's a ton of pent-up demand for both automobiles and housing, and that is why we get the development of suburbs, right? So people who maybe got married in the 1940s and are living in the attic of their parents' house in an urban area. They wanna have kids, right? They don't wanna live in their parents' house anymore. So they end up buying a tiny little town, little house in Levittown, right? And that's the first suburb. So you get this huge, there's so much pent up demand from the Great Depression and the Second World War that you get this kind of explosion of construction. You get an explosion of people purchasing automobiles because of course now you're living outside of the city. So this becomes a classic 1950s thing. So the wife drives the family automobile to the train station to drop off the husband so he can take the train into the city to work. And obviously this is very like New York City thing. This is not happening everywhere, but that's really the first suburb. So the woman becomes the controller of the automobile during the day for the most part. Um, and she's the main consumer 
right? And so you kind of have um, a lot more use of automobiles to drive longer distances in order to get things. Oh, in the 1950s, post-war is also the birth of the great American road trip. Maybe you went on one of these when you were growing up. I went on a lot of road trips when I was growing up. Um, Americans start traveling to national parks. You know, obviously we've been doing that since they were founded, but there's a huge research and some interest in national parks. Post-war, I think in large part because a lot of the improvements made by the WPA and CCC. Um, we have Disney World and Disneyland open. Maine becomes vacation land and Cape Cod for the East Coast. You have California and Route 66 becomes a big destination. You have all of our national landmarks that people are like checking off their list. Like, oh, gotta see the Grand Canyon, gotta see Mount Rushmore, gotta go to all these places, right? So people are driving everywhere. Most people by the 1950s are not traveling by train. We still have train travel, and particularly in the 1930s and 40s, train travel was still very popular, especially on the East Coast. But more and more people are traveling long distances by personal automobile. Um, Dunkin' Donuts is another really, I didn't realize a lot of these were this early in their founding. So Dunkin' Donuts is founded in 1948. Here's our other Quincy, Massachusetts fast food origin story. Uh, William Rosenberg opens the open kettle, which is donuts and coffee. Now donuts and coffee, have a much longer history than Dunkin' Donuts. They proliferated across the country in diners, you know, repurposed rail cars and street cars. Um, you have like very kind of kitschy little individualistic um, uh, diners and stuff that are like in tea kettles or in like a pig or a dog, you know, these kind of really quirky architecture that develops in the 1920s and 30s. Um, so he decides coffee and donuts is like a winning combination. People are want them, they like them. So he opens the open kettle. And in 1950, he changes the name to Dunkin' Donuts because he notices a lot of people are dipping the donuts in their coffee, right? So he thinks that's a better name than open kettle. It's franchised in 1955. By 1965, there's 100 Dunkin' Donuts across the country. Um, in 1972, they introduced munchkins, which are the donut holes, right? And then, you know, from there, they just kind of grow and proliferate across the country. This is the original location in Quincy. Um, this is not obviously the 1948 <laughs> or it was a 1950 uh, photograph. This is from around the 1960s, um, but it's got the Dunkin' Donuts um, script, right, which kind of persists throughout uh, and then of course they boast about their coffee. Most people will tell you you don't go to Dunkin Donuts for the donuts, you go for the coffee, right? Burger King is another interesting one. This one has a little bit more, I think, complicated story than some of these others. Um, it starts as Insta Burger King in Jacksonville, Florida in 1953. So the founders were inspired by McDonald's and they had this um, machine called the Insta Broiler, right? Which is basically, instead of frying, um, frying the burgers on a flat top, on a griddle, um, it broils them, right? It sends them on like a little conveyor belt and broils it. So it's like having grilled hamburgers, but fast in a restaurant. So they franchise almost immediately. Um, in 1957, they invent the Whopper, which is a larger burger, which was not common at the time. Think about other burger restaurants. You have White Castle, which is teeny little sliders. Um, and then you have McDonald's, which is a relatively thin burger patty because you're frying it on a flat top, right? It's, you want it to be fast. A thicker burger is going to take longer to cook. Um, you know, if longer cooks, the more likely it is to get dried out. If it's fatter, it might not cook through all the way in time. But the Whopper is a bigger burger and that is kind of part of Burger King's claim to fame. But things get a little complicated in Burger King corporate history, more complicated than a lot of the other fast food places. So um, in 1959, Insta Burger King is not doing well in part because their Insta Broiler is finicky, right? The melting beef tallow from broiling it is like gumming up the works. It's 
constantly. Um, so they get bought out, it's restructured, it's renamed Burger King, and they change their broiler system to not be a conveyor belt system anymore. It's still flame broiled, um, but it's not that conveyor belt system anymore. In 1967, it's purchased by Pillsbury. So this is the 1960s. There's a lot of consolidation in food companies. You start to have conglomerates form. You have investment firms buying out these kind of corporate, um, these companies that have franchisees. There's, in the 1960s, a push to get franchisees to standardize more. Like, it was kind of like the Wild West and early franchise agreements. Um, there was a lot of differences depending where in the country you went. They might have totally different menu items. Like, they might not be using the same recipes. So in the 1960s and 70s, there's kind of like this push to kind of lock down the brand. Um, and investment firms and other big companies had a lot to do with that. So Pils Pilsbury buys it in 1967, tries to implement their some reforms. 1974, they, they implement the Have It Your Way campaign, which is like to this day their most recognizable campaign. Um, and then throughout the 70s and 80s, they undergo like a lot of different changes to their corporate structure that doesn't seem to have a huge impact on the restaurants themselves, thankfully. Um, this is a great example from probably about 1965, judging by the clothes and the cars, right? It's always nice to have those cars in the picture help you date a photo. Uh, and so here it's also saying home of the Whopper, right? So um, it's after 1957 for sure. Sonic gets developed almost at the same time. Um, again, we have Rep Beer and Ball. So 1953, Troy Smith opens the Top Hat Drive-In in Shawnee, Oklahoma. And it was an abandoned Rep Beer stand. So somebody had opened a Rep Beer stand, didn't work out. Troy Smith comes along and says, hey, I'm going to buy this property and I'm going to turn it into a drive-in. And his innovation is he is traveling in Louisiana and he sees somebody has rigged up a homemade intercom system for people to order from. He says, this is genius. You don't have to wait for the car hop to come to you. You don't have to go to a walk up to order. You can, you can stay in your car. You can order right from your car. So that's his big innovation. He also installs car canopies, which a lot of drive-ins did not have. Um, so you're sheltered right from the sun. You're sheltered from any rain or anything, right? Uh, and then he puts his car hops on roller skates, which was not an uncommon thing, but, but that really becomes part of the brand, and it's still part of the brand today. So he opens a second location in 1956, um, and then a couple more. So he's got four of these top hat locations, but he can't franchise because the name Top Hat is already trademarked for a restaurant. And their slogan at the time, again, this is like the atomic age, right? The jet age. The slogan was service with this at, sorry, at the speed of sound, it should say. So that's where they get the name Sonic, right? From Sonic Boom. Um, so in 1959, they renamed it Sonic. Um, and then interestingly, again, this is a franchised uh, restaurant. In 1995, this is an instance of where, um, a lot of Sonics were not particularly uniform in their operation. So Sonic Corporation launched the Sonic 2000 plan to get the franchises to conform and become more uniform by the year 2000, um, which is really when Sonic then starts to expand outside the Southeast um, and into places like New York. This is one of the original top hat drive in i love that they have their aristocrat hamburgers but it's a wiener dog <laughs> with a top hat uh, it's pretty cute this is an undated photo but judging by the cars looks like it's from early 60s uh with the new sonic name again it's drive-in with curb service you can see all the canopies there um, and you can't really see them in this picture, but that's also where the intercoms are for you to order right from your car. All right, Taco Bell is a little bit different than most of our fast food places we're talking about tonight. It is neither fried chicken, nor hamburgers, nor hot dogs. 
It is tacos. Um, in 1950, Glenn Bell opens Bell's Drive-In in San Bernardino, California, which starts out focused on burgers and hot dogs, but he sees across the street this Mexican cafe called Nitla Cafe, which was founded in 1936. And San Bernardino at this time is a relatively racially segregated city. Um, Mexicans were segregated all kind of in one area and Nitla Cafe was really the headquarters for that community. Um, and they had something called Tacos Dorados, which was a fried corn tortilla, right? Fried until crispy, filled with ground beef, shredded cheese, shredded iceberg lettuce, and chopped tomatoes. Does that sound familiar to you? Yeah, that's because Glenn Bell saw how successful they were. Like there were lines at this cafe and he decided I'm gonna replicate that. And he even basically got them to show him how they made their tacos. And he basically stole their idea <laughs> without giving them any credit. And so in 1951, a year later, he opens a taco stand um, first called Taco Tia and then El Taco. And he basically, um, you know, steals the Mitla Taco Dorado idea because um, he thinks it'll be really popular with white people. And he makes the uh, assembly faster and more standardized and fries the tortillas a little bit differently for the hard shells. He does not fry them to order like they did at Mitla. So in 1962, uh, he renamed it to Taco Bell. Uh, and the original locations, the original Taco Bell locations were walk up only. They were not eaten, they did not have drive-ins, they were not, they did not have drive through right? The original ones are walk up only. Uh, and then he franchises Taco Bell. And the first franchise opens in Torrance, Carol, Cal California in 1964. By 1967, there are a hundred franchisees. Um, in 1978, PepsiCo purchases Taco Bell from Glen Bell, um, and Taco Bell's proliferate across the country because they are very popular with white people. <laughs> um, so I found this little collage of images, including a picture of Bell's Hamburgers, um, the original shop, um, Taco Tia and El Taco, right? Those are the first versions. Um, and this is actually from a page trying to save the first Taco Bell location in Downey, California. Um, it was slated for demolition. And they are trying to like remove it from the site to save it as like this first iconic Taco Bell. Uh, however, <laughs> Mitla Cafe is still open. It's now a classic historic Route 66 landmark. Um, it is still operated pretty much the same as it has been since 1936. Um, and you can still get a Taco Cerrado. Uh, and they run and really deserve the credit for the popularity of Taco Bell. So I'm putting them in there. And we didn't even know this um, until a couple of years ago, um, I think in 2019, I have it at the end, where uh, a historian published a book called Taco USA that uncovered this story by talking to the Mexican rest residents um, of San Bernardino. And they're like, oh yeah, we've been doing this since 1936 and that Glenn Bell guy stole our idea. <laughs> so kind of an interesting story, our, our only uh, cultural appropriation story uh, in our fast food talk tonight. I'm just gonna take a moment because I see there's a question here in the chat and I think it is, um, it is not related. So I'm gonna leave that one for the end, okay? We're going to keep going. All right, interstate highways, right? We're in the 1950s, but we still don't really have interstate highways just yet. Uh, in 1916, right, we had the Federal Road Aid Act, which offered federal funding to states for highway improvement. 1921, we have the Federal Highway Act. 1939, the Bureau of Public Roads has a report to Congress, toll roads and free roads. And they, this is the first time they say, hey, we should have this national system of interstate highways um, to promote interstate commerce, right? Interstate commerce is under the jurisdiction of the federal government. They said the federal government should get involved. 
1944 is when we approved the Highway 8 Act, which says, yes, we should have interstate highways, but there was no funding <laughs> for this idea, right? It was just kind of like Congress saying, yeah, that's a good idea, but we're not going to implement it because we don't want to spend the money. In 1956, Dwight D. Eisenhower signs the Federal Highway Act, which appropriated $26 billion in 1956 dollars to construct this highway. It was deemed complete in 1992. The bulk of the construction occurred in the 1960s and 70s. Um, and it's called the Eisenhower Interstate Highway System because Dwight D. Eisenhower is the one who signed it to law. There is, there are some misconceptions. Um, there was at one point uh, the words for defense listed on a lot of the rhetoric around the interstate highway system. And I think that's probably how they got that big of an appropriation pass. It's like, hey, this is good for national defense, but that was not the purpose of the highways. Um, also, apparently highways are not straight for airplanes to land on them. That's not the purpose of life history. <laughs> it may be convenient for airplanes that are in trouble to be able to land on our interstate highways, but um, that's not the reason why they're straight. So just a little bit of myth busting about highways. All right, so once we get all this underway, all of a sudden we're building these interstate highways. Um, so this is a map of the approved highway plan adopted in 1957. Um, you can see there's lots of highways out east, not as many out west. That reflected a lot of the population um, settlement patterns at that time. And the numbering system um, is mostly even numbers go east west and odd numbers go north south but that's not 100 percent true all of the time um, numbering system uh also i believe starts on the east coast no it doesn't it starts on okay never mind forget i said that i don't know the <laughs> logic behind the numbering system probably based on when the highways were constructed so what's the impact of the interstate highway system. So it was not popular in a lot of areas, um, in large part because it bypassed a lot of towns that had previously been on pretty established transportation routes. Um, the interstate highway, you also could not get on and off it whenever you wanted, right? You have to wait for an exit. So there are not very many crossroads, which if you wanna go really fast is great because you don't have to stop Right, but if you're trying to get across an interstate highway and the next exit is, you know, far away, <laughs> that's not helpful for you. And in a lot of rural areas, they had to build, um, because they're building interstate highways like through the middle of a farm's agricultural land. So you have agricultural lands on both sides of the highway. They actually had to build a lot of tunnels underneath for like cattle and equipment and stuff to get underneath, um, especially out west. Because the interstate highway system bypassed a lot of towns that were on these established highway routes, you start to get a decline in a lot of mom and pop restaurants. So if you're traveling cross country, you can now do it much more quickly, um, but you're not driving through the middle of towns anymore. Uh, if you've ever gone up to Maine, taking Highway 1 and taking the interstate are two very different experiences, right? And because you you're not driving through the middle of these towns and seeing these little mom and pop places a lot of them start to disappear a lot of them are in towns that are bypassed by the interstate highway system for instance um route 66 in the 70s really starts to decline because people are are taking more and more interstates um you do get the rise of rest areas which was something that had started with highways more generally, state highways, it's a safe place for motorists to get off, pull off of the road. Often, excuse me, there were restrooms, often there were picnic groves, things like that. Um, but after the interstate highway system, you start to get the rise of service areas, right? This is kind of pioneered by Howard Johnson's on the turnpikes in the 1940s. Um, and some states actually do prohibit private businesses from operating a service area. Service areas are um, largely operated by the state 
Department of Transportation, um, but some places in the Northeast, like in New York, you know, you have uh, like HMS host, you're subcontracting out the concessions and subcontracting the gas, right? So, but other places, private businesses not allowed. So you don't necessarily have gas and restaurants available at the surface or you have to get off the interstate for that. And because you have to get off the interstate, right? You start to have these little kind of any town USA towns spring up at the exits. So you have gas, you have lodging, you have food, usually fast food. Um, and in the 1970s, you get the proliferation of those blue highway signs that tell you what services are available at the exits because the companies, the restaurants, the gas stations, the hotels pay a fee to have um, their, their business advertised on the highway so on the highway as a service to motorists so they know what's what's available at the exit. But again, because of that, you get who can afford <laughs> to build, you know, new construction at these exits, who can afford to advertise on the highway signs. It's these big corporate backed franchised locations. So it's no longer, you know, like Joe's gas station, it's Sunoco and Mobile and Gulf. And it's no longer, you know, Grandma Millie's Cafe, it's McDonald's and KFC and Burger King, you know? So that's, that helps contribute to this kind of sameness across the country. So that's one of the downsides of these interstate highways. This is the High Five Interchange <laughs> in Dallas, Texas. This is kind of an example of the worst of interstate highways and you can see there is just nothing under them. Elevated highways, elevated overpasses really can bisect communities. A lot of interstate highways were built on property that was owned by poor and middle class black families, immigrant communities, you know, that were kind of eminent domain out of the way. Um, because they were politically expendable. Uh, and that's why a lot of highways, particularly in, in very populated areas in the Northeast, a lot of those highways get built that way. Um, all right, we're kind of in this transition period now in the late 1950s going into the 1960s and 70s between drive-ins and drive-throughs. So the first drive-in as far as I can tell in the country, there's some dispute over this, but supposedly the first drive-in is Kirby's Pig Stand in Dallas, Texas in 1921, right? So not quite uh, Howard Johnson's. Um, they really proliferate in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, you, you know, you have car hops, that's, you're eating in your car, which is a very American thing. Other countries don't really do that. And because of drive-ins, you have the development of cup holders, right? And other places where you can put your stuff to eat in your car, instead of just like the over the window tray, right? That's so classic. Um, 1975, McDonald's opens the first drive through in Sierra Vista, Arizona. And it's for a really interesting reason. It's because soldiers from Fort Huachuca, I think I'm saying that right, when they were off base and in uniform, they could not leave their vehicle. But McDonald's like, well, you can't get out of the car to come in and order. So we're going to make it so you don't have to leave your car to order. And so that's how they get the first drive through. Um, what we think of today as the modern cup holder, where you can leave your drink, your beverage in the cup holder and drive around and it's not going to spill, is developed by Chrysler in 1983 as part of their minivans, right? So who's in minivans? Families. So that's the main demographic for, hey, we're going to stop and get a bite and eat in our car. So here's a great photo from 1945 from Life magazine. There's a whole bunch of teenage girls getting milkshakes and burgers, and they're smoking, and they're convertible, right? And they're being served by a car hop. And I take this photo, A, because it's just a great iconic photo, and also because it's got that tray, right, that hooks over the side of your vehicle. Um, it's another later example in the 1950s of a drive-in, drive-in restaurant. 
Um, so it also says that there's car service. You can eat in the restaurant or they will bring your food out to you in your vehicle. Hardy's, 1960. Wilbur Hardy opens the first restaurant in Greenville, South Carolina. They franchised in 1963. By 1969, there's 200 restaurants. Um, in the 1970s, they start buying up other smaller chain restaurants, other franchises, um, and kind of rolling them in as Hardee's. Uh, for instance, in 1990, they acquired Roy Rogers, which we're going to get to. Uh, and in 1997, they were bought in turn by Carl's Juniors, which is interesting because at the time of this um, acquisition, Carl's Juniors had like 700 locations and Hardee's had like 3,500 locations. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic there that Carl's Juniors bought Hardee's. Um, this is a very early, uh, the first Hardee's franchise location opened in Rocky Mount, North Carolina in 1961, but this photo is from 1980. Around 1980, right before it was torn down. So. Um, Arby's is another early one, a little bit different than some of our other, you know, classic burger fast food places. They focused on roast beef sandwiches. They opened in 1964. They're the Raffle Brothers. So it's RB, which is how they get the name Arby's. Um, and they kind of have like a little bit of a luxury aesthetic going on they charge a lot more for their food than like mcdonald's is 15 cents a burger they're charging 69 cents for their roast beef sandwiches um they franchise in 1965 they invent curly q fries later just shortened to curly fries in 1988 and interestingly they are among the first fast food restaurants to offer a light calorie conscious menu in 1991 so again, it's very much like Western style roast beef, which is why they have that iconic um, 10 gallon hat, right, as their logo. So this is an early location from 1970. Roy Rogers. This is a really interesting um, franchise, I think. So it starts as Roby's House of Beef in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And it was started by a franchise group. Azar's Big Boy. So Big Boy was a restaurant franchise that started in 1936, kind of as a drive-in. I didn't include it here because there just aren't that many Big Boys anymore and people aren't as familiar with them. Um, but it's, it started by another franchise, which I found interesting, and they opened six locations all at once. So this is not started by an individual person who then franchised it. It started like to have another interesting franchise. Um, in 1968, they're acquired by the Marriott family. And all of this stuff happens in 1968. So Marriott acquires Ro Roby's house of beef. They're sued by Arby's for trademark infringement because they think it's too close to the name. They're like, okay, we have to come up with a new name. So they offer, they talk to Roy Rogers who had been interested in getting into fast food franchises already. And they say, hey, we'll give you royalties if you let us use your name. So he says, yes, um, they convert one of their Hot Shop Juniors in Virginia and another one in Maryland. Remember, Hot Shop started out as an A&W franchise that was run by the Marriott family. So their first Roy Rogers are conversions of those Hot Shops. Um, and then existing Robies began to convert to the Roy Rogers name. And they filmed a television advertisement campaign with Roy Rogers himself all in 1968. It's a lot. The next year they had 100 restaurants um, and Marriott had been very, very optimistic about the growth level of this restaurant. They thought it was going to have this exponential growth. You know, they opened 100 restaurants in 1969 where they're like, we're going to have like 500 restaurants open by 1970. They have like 160 restaurants open in the 1970s. You know, it's a much slower growth than I anticipated. They're sold to Hardee's in 1990. Um, and there aren't that many of them left anymore. There are some freestanding Roy Rogers that are operated by franchises, um, but most of them are run by HMS hosts in travel plazas, which is where you find them in New York. Another early version, like the early versions were really like campy Western, <laughs> very classically 1960s, 70s, right? Um, I think this is my last one, Subway. 
because this is kind of, I wanted to talk about this one because it gets its start in the 1960s, but it ends up being kind of like this transition fast food place. So it's another really interesting story. It starts in 1965. Um, a 17-year-old kid named Fred DeLuca is trying to have a summer job to save up for college, and his friend Peter Buck, who already had like gone through medical school and was a doctor, um, says, hey, I'll loan you a hundred bucks. Why don't we open a sandwich shop? Or sorry, a thousand dollars. He says, why don't we open a sandwich shop? So they do. Fred, Fred and Pete open Pete Super Submarines in Bridgeport, Connecticut in 1965. And this is a different kind of fast food. It's using the same kind of assembly line process that other fast food places are using, but it's cold sandwiches and a lot of vegetables, which submarine sandwiches were common at the time, but not in this type of fast food franchise environment. They're really the first people to do it on this level. In 1968, they changed the name to Subway. Um, they opened 16 more stores by the early 70s, but they were not able to grow at the rate that they wanted to, to basically send friends <laughs> pay friends way through college. So they decided to franchise right in, in the 1970s. So their first franchisee opens in Wine for Connecticut in 1974. And they just kind of grow from there. 2008, they get really famous for their $5 footlong campaign. Um, this is the original, one of the original Pete's subways. Um, so they are kind of on the forefront of like the healthy fast food revolution that sort of starts to take off in the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, Wendy's, another kind of like these incestuous fast food relationships are happening. In the 1950s, Dave Thomas is working with Harlan Sanders on KFC franchises in Fort Wayne. He is a cook for this small chain of restaurants that Harlan Sanders approaches about basically turning into um, Kentucky Fried Chicken locations. Um, and so he works with Sanders pretty closely. He's actually the one who suggests that Sanders should be like the face of KFC and they should use his image as part of the logo. Um, and he learns a lot about franchising and about the KFC system. He also gets involved as an kind of involved with the investment firm that opens Arthur Treacher's, which is like a fish and chips place, which I didn't include in this because most people have never heard of it. <laughs> um, and so in 1969, he takes all of this knowledge and decides he's going to open um, Wendy's. He names it after his daughter. He had been inspired by another kind of little fast food place in his hometown in Michigan. Um, and he goes with square burgers. And this is like a marketing ploy because the burger sticks out over the side of the bun. It looks big, right? Even though it's probably not actually any heavier, you know, like more weight. It's not more meat than a round burger, but because it sticks over the sides, it looks big, right? Um, they have their first franchisee in Indianapolis in 1972. 1984, they have their Where's the Beef campaign, which is hugely popular. Um, and then this is a super cute picture of eight-year-old Wendy Thomas. Her name is actually Melinda, um, but apparently when she was a kid, she couldn't pronounce Melinda, so she said Wenda, and then that transformed into Wendy. Dave Thomas actually says later he regrets naming it after his kid and making her like the mascot, because that put a lot of pressure on her. Um, but this is from the grand opening of the very first restaurant. She's holding up the burger. And then this is like the classic style of Wendy's um, from the 1970s. All right, so that is my world rent tour of fast food restaurants. I want to just give a little bit of context about what was going on and why it kind of ended in the 1960s. So obviously there are other restaurants that continue to evolve and be franchised post 1970s, but these existing restaurants really start to take off in their expansion plans in the 1960s and 70s. Um, so there's a couple of reasons for that. So prior to the 1970s, a lot of fast food was sort of like an occasional treat, right? Or if you were traveling, it was something that you ate. It was not an everyday food. You were definitely not eating it for all meals of the day. And that starts to change in the 1970s for a bunch of reasons. We have more women in the workplace, 
So because we need to have dual income, thanks in large part to a recession, and also because more women are voluntarily entering the workplace, um, they have less free time. So how do you feed your family when you're short on time, right? And also because fast food is very much designed to be addictive, right? <laughs> um, you start to get a rise in every day more frequent use of fast food as meals in the 1970s. We also have changing agricultural policy under Nixon. So we had some surplus, um, agricultural surplus after World War II. In the 1970s, we changed how we subsidize agriculture in such a way that commodity crops like soy, like wheat, um, like corn, and in turn high fructose corn syrup, actually become cheaper for food um, food processors to buy than it is to produce. So basically the federal government is paying farmers a price floor and if the market price goes below that floor, you know, the federal government will make up the difference for the farmer, but guess what? That means that the price falls below the floor and all of a sudden you know, there's all these cheap commodity crops that you can make a lot of very tasty fast food out of. Um, fast food also starts to move away from the highway a little bit um, in terms of expansion. I think by the time we get to the 1970s, most fast food had kind of saturated the market. There were more interstate highways being built, um, but they weren't necessarily going to population centers. They weren't necessarily going to tourist destinations, right? We're filling in the rest of the map. Um, so a lot of fast food places start to expand into more urban areas, not necessarily, you know, on major thoroughfares. They start targeting black and minority groups, but especially black Americans. Um, as we get kind of the donut effect in American culture, where we have white flight in the 1960s and 70s out of urban areas, um, you start to get the development also of food deserts, right, where there's ample fast food, but there's very little access to groceries and fresh food. Um, in the 1980s, you have the rise of drive throughs and kind of an increased pace of life. You have more family, emphasis on families and fast food. It becomes kind of like an everyday food instead of a special treat. Um, and a lot of fast food places really start targeting kids with things like Happy Meals and toys and things like that in the 1980s. These are a couple of examples of advertising campaigns that specifically targeted black families. Um, McDonald's did a ton. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, at the end because there's a great book that you can read about this. Um, so this one is specifically says, when your job keeps you hopping, you've got to eat when you can. So it's good to know McDonald's is always close by. The food is good and hot. The prices are low and the service is right on time. Sure is good to have around. So it's a little racist, right, to have that hop in on there. But here's two regular guys laughing it up, eating their McDonald's. I don't know what kind of work they do. The one guy looks like he has a change thing on his belt there. Um, so it's targeting working class black Americans as like a good place to get lunch. The other one is, hey, look, we're having our fast food in our house and they're surprising dad with fast food and says, have it your way, right? That's part of the have it your way campaign from Burger King. So these are just some of the ways that um, companies, you know, post civil rights, um, post desegregation, were targeting um, a new audience for them, which was black and minority families. So what's the future of fast food? We've talked a lot about the past. So in the 1990s to the 2000s, you know, fast food becomes less popular in some ways because there's a renewed interest in healthy food. You get fast food places that are offering salads, you know, the kids meal, you can get apple slices instead of french fries. Subway becomes super popular in the 90s. But at the same time, you get fast food in schools school lunches, some schools start allowing fast food um, into the lunchroom, especially in high schools. And there's a real association in the 1990s and early 2000s with fast food as kid food, right? So that's what kids like. Oh, so we're going to give the kids a treat, right? The focus is more on children. 
There is a backlash starting in the 2000s against fast food. You get the rise of fast fresh, right? There's more emphasis on like salad and smoothie places, um, other types of food other than burgers, right? You get like Panera and stuff like that kind of coming to the fore. Um, there's also a lot more renewed interest in local food ways. And I mean that both in terms of local agriculture, but also like regional mom and pop places and saving, trying to save and revive these places that were taken out by competition from corporate fast food, you know, taken out by being bypassed by highways. Um, in the 1990s, this push is kind of really pioneered by um, Jane and Michael Stern who are doing a lot of work trying to document these disappearing um, regional mom and pop restaurants. Uh, the 2000s and 2020s, you also get a huge rise in food trucks. Food trucks proliferate, like that's the new push cart, right? And for the 21st century. And the other thing that's happening in a lot of fast food is automation, right? Um, labor is expensive. And so if you can automate and eliminate labor costs, um, you're going to keep prices down. Also, people are, you know, in our digital age, we just want to order from our phone and not have to interact with anybody, right? <laughs> so that is also happening. Future of highways, believe it or not, also being discussed. So throughout the 1970s and 80s, you have the destruction of a lot of Black neighborhoods thanks to elevated highways, either, you know, raising areas in order to make room for, for bypasses and elevated highways and exchanges and things like that. You also have overpasses basically sucking the life um, and elevated highways sucking the life out of a lot of these communities. Um, and there's also a lot of increased congestion and smog, usually in poor and minority communities because of this. Obviously, in the 1990s, the interstate is completed. It's not actually, but it's pretty much complete. We have eternal highway construction, right? Because there's so much use. And there is actually evidence that the more lanes you build, the more traffic just expands to fill those lanes. Though there is some backlash against the proliferation of interstate highways and a push to move more traffic onto local roads. It's a little bit slower, but it's safer. It spreads out the effect a little bit. And also a lot of local roads are just empty. It's unused infrastructure because all of the traffic is being funneled to the interstate highways. Um, there's also an increasing move to remove elevated highways and bypasses um, from communities or to otherwise repurpose that eminent domain land underneath in order to help revitalize these communities that were kind of destroyed by, by the um, construction of these houses. So what does the future look like? Uh, we have kind of two options. We can lean in to fast food and like go full on, you know, technology of the future. But what are the, what are the cons? So that relies on cheap agriculture, a stable climate, um, it produces a lot of waste. It's still very car reliant, so it also relies on a lot of fossil fuels. Um, and it's not very good for us, right? Fast food is, is not good for us. What's the other option? You can change the dynamic. And these are what some people are thinking about, you know, the use of local cafeterias and communal dining. So it's still kind of that, almost like going back to the automat or old school, like 1920s and 30s cafeterias where it's, still sort of self-serve the food is always available um, it's very fast but you know it's more homemade food um, farm to table dining is starting to get super popular meatless foods right we have the proliferation quite recently of impossible burgers and beyond burgers and veggie burgers and all kinds of fun stuff like that what are the cons of this it's not currently scalable we do not have the money and the infrastructure in a lot of areas to make this a reality. And then also, what are the logistics? Fast food has their logistics figured out. I mean, it's figured out for the 20th century and a stable climate and abundant fossil fuels, but, you know, we haven't really had a big conversation about what the future of food in America that is fast and relatively cheap and widely accessible looks like, right? 
right? Because it's also not widely accessible. We still have a lot of food deserts. We have food swamps, which is a new term to describe areas where there's tons of bad for you fast food <laughs> and very few grocery stores or otherwise fresh food. And I wanna leave with um, this sort of crazy rendering that I found, which was a future proof Burger King, right? So it has a much smaller urban footprint um, there's very little parking. It's got walk-up outdoor ordering. That's like throwback, right, to the early days of walk-up. It's got multiple lanes of, um, you know, uh, takeout, drive-through ordering, and then it's got outdoor seating and indoor seating. Um, so this was super interesting to me because I see what they're trying to do, but it's also still super reliant on cars right, and super reliant on, um, you know, the, inf the current infrastructure that already exists. So thank you for listening to me, Babylon. I'm going to leave you with a couple of additional resources if you guys are interested. I can't believe I've talked for this long. I'm super sorry. I didn't realize I was going to be this long. You're my guinea pigs. It's the first time I've done this talk. Um, some great further resources if you're interested in reading more, Selling It by the Sack. White Castle and the Creation of American Food, Fast Food, Roadside Restaurants in the Automobile Age, um, Taco USA, that's the one that kind of broke the story about Mitla, the Mitla Cafe, and how Glenn Bell like, totally stole tacos, Taco Bell from them. Um, Drive Through Dreams, A Journey Through the Heart of America's Fast Food Kingdom, and then most recently, and now a James Beard Award winner, uh, Franchise, The Golden Archers in Black America by Marsha Chatelaine. I happen to have my copy right here. Really fascinating look at the role of McDonald's in the black community and also the role of um, McDonald's in black capitalism because a lot of the expansion of McDonald's into black communities was driven by black franchise owners. So super interesting, just came out in 2020, highly recommend. All right, now we can go to questions. I see there's a bunch in the chat, so I'm gonna go through them in a chronological order. Um, okay. Gail is asking me a question I don't know how to answer. She says, is, did Carol's predate Burger King and was Burger King part of Carol's Corp? I have never heard of Carol's. Um, so I can't answer that question. I'm sorry. We'll have to look it up. And then John, how much did Glenn Bell get for Taco Bell? Man, that's the kind of thing you gotta Google. I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. Historians can't know everything, people. We try, but it's kind of impossible. Um, John also asked how much did it cost to get a blue sign in the 1970s. It's pretty cheap. I think it was like 40 bucks. It's obviously a lot more now, um, but it was pretty accessible to a lot of, of restaurants when it was first released. Oh, Sandra, can you show the evolution of the auto slide again? Yes, I can go back to that. Um, John, when did Wendy's get rid of the hot and juicy slogan? Oh gosh, I don't know. I, so I did also think about adding Long John Silver's um, to this and I decided to get rid of it because it was also already way too long and um, it just it's not a very interesting story of franchise but um, and yes Ira I can put the further reading references in the chat let me stop sharing and I will just open that up and copy and paste it for you give me one second um, and these are all currently in print. Obviously, there's there's more out there, but these are the ones um, that I was familiar with and have read, and I think they're they're pretty well researched, good sources. So here, okay, let me change it to everybody. Here is the list. There you go. Um, and also, I think Krista can probably email it. So who did? Okay, Sandra wanted to see the evolution of the auto slideshow again. So let me go back to that one. If I can find it, there's so many. Um, okay, I hope you meant this slide. I'm going to share my screen again. And I must have a disclaimer, I'm not an automobile historian. <laughs> but this is just kind of a very vague general overview of you know, kind of how automobiles start to proliferate in the United States. So again, 1893, is we have um, the Dury, I'm pronouncing that correct, Motor Wagon Company, and then they, uh, in 19, 1896, 
produce the, the first American made automobile and they get involved in this automobile race in the 1890s <laughs> that really they, they win and that really makes the name for that company. Um, obviously they're not around today. I don't know the evolution of if they got bought up by a bigger company. Um, besides Ford, you know, Chrysler Oldsmobile was another really early automobile company that kind of survived long term. But there are, you know, it's like uh, there are automobile companies that's like two guys in their garage <laughs> making like two cars, you know, and then there's there's people like Henry Ford who are, you know, kind of, you know, popularizing and pioneering the assembly line to make hundreds of thousands of cars. Um, so it's it's interesting. It's kind of like like fast food and food conglomerates in general that there's the overall trend of the 20th century has been brand consolidation and buying up smaller brands um, without a lot of trespassing happening in part because there's just a fair amount of competition. Um, but I hope that's the slideshow you want. All right, gosh, you guys, you have stuck around. I can't believe I talked for this long. Does anybody else have any other questions? Sorry for keeping you up so late, Krista. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Uh, I got a few more hours for my bedtime. Okay, good. <laughs> but thanks so much, everybody, for coming out. Thanks again, Sarah. Um, that was really informative. I learned a whole lot. And just a reminder, this is being recorded. So if you want to ever check back or if you miss something, you'll be able to watch this recording anytime on our YouTube channel. And also I'll be emailing it out once I have the recording uh, available to everyone who registered and signed up. And thanks for all the great questions. And if anyone doesn't have any more questions, I guess we can say good night and uh, hope to see you again sometime soon, Sarah. Yeah, and if you're like me and you think of a question after the fact, because that happens to me all the time, you can always, I'm on Facebook, you know, my, my website is thefoodhistorian.com. You can track me down and, and follow up if you want to. Great, cool. Well, good night. Thanks, Krista. Thanks, everybody. See you later.